Good morning. We're going to wait just a few moments for people to hop on this live and we'll be back shortly. Hello again, everyone. Good morning. I'm Captain Jordan Kraft, the State Public Affairs Officer for the Ohio National Guard, and I will be with you this morning moderating today's town hall. We have with us today ad our Adjutant General, who brought some special guests to talk about our medical support to prisons and the food bank mission one month later um, and the impact we've had in our communities. Sir, I'll turn it over to you for introductions. Hi, good morning. I'm Major General John Harris. I'm the Adjutant General. Good morning, I'm Jory Novotny, Director, Director of External Affairs for the Ohio Association of Food Banks. Good morning, I'm Captain Elena Gonzalez. I'm a Medical Service Corps Officer, as well as the Liaison Officer for the National Guard for the Joint Medical Planning. Thank you all for joining us this morning. Sir, would you mind providing an overall status update for our viewers on what the Ohio National Guard is currently doing? Sure, we've had a bit of a shift since the last time we did one of these. Uh, the enduring mission is, of course, the food bank mission. You'll hear more about that later. We have almost 500 soldiers that are out supporting 13 food banks around the country, uh, as well as the enduring mission of uh, helping the Ohio Department of Health with their PPE warehouse, and also our Ohio Military Reserve, which is bringing in donations at the Sullivan Avenue Armory. What's changed is, uh, you know, last time we did this, we talked pretty extensively about building out the alternate care sites in order to build in preparation for the surge so that we didn't exceed our medical capacity. And we're still thinking about that. And we're, of course, adjusting the numbers based on the modeling. But, but we're shifting the, the primary focus to more of the hot spots right now. So, for example, watching what happens in the prisons and our, our congregate living facilities and, and, and putting emphasis on that. So our, our engineers are looking at how we might be able to help the prisons build out their capacity so they can spread spread their uh, inmates out a little bit further. We've established some Dervis systems, some of our uh, disaster response bed down systems in one of the prisons to give them the ability to, to spread their spread the inmates out to help slow the, the spread of the virus through that facility, as well as putting some of our medical teams inside the prisons to assist their, their clinical staff. We have medical folks in the Elkton Federal uh, Correctional Facility over in Columbiana County, as well as uh, uh, some folks down in the uh, Pickaway Correctional Facility helping out, helping surge that medical staff there also. Again, helping helping tamp down these hot spots because we know that's kind of what we're going to see for the next few weeks here. Great. Thank you so much, sir. We're actually going to organize today's town hall a little bit differently by topic, so we're not hopping around from you know food banks to our medical support and back. And so um, with that, we'll go ahead and get right into our, our Q&A with some questions on our food bank mission. Uh, and sir, my first question will be for you. Um, like we mentioned earlier, it's been about one month since our soldiers and airmen stepped up almost to the day uh, to support food banks across the state. They've worked tirelessly, more than 73,000 man hours spent distributing more than 8 million pounds of food. Um, and believe it or not, over 130,000 meal deliveries have been um, given to those in need. I think seeing the gratitude on our people's face, sir, is really all they need to keep going day to day. But what's your message to them? Well, well, my message to them is, is keep doing what you're doing. I couldn't be more proud of you. 
Uh, you've been on mission longer than anyone else. Uh, the first folks that we put out there in the field in support of our communities and uh, all the feedback has been just off the charts. Uh, not only from the folks who work at the food banks, the people who run the food banks, but also from the people in the community who are in need of that food from the food banks. Um, your work ethic has been completely unwavering. Um, your, your morale has been off the charts, but most importantly, the impact of that you're making in the communities is, is pretty significant. Uh, I have the opportunity uh, daily, a couple times a day, to sit in on calls with the governor and some of the senior staff and they talk about how critical these food banks are to sustaining people in our communities during this crisis. Uh, not only the funding for the food banks, but, but the workforce for the food banks and keeping those things going. Uh, Governor DeWine actually had his wife, Fran DeWine, sit in on one of the calls so that um, she had visibility of what was going on because this is of great interest to her. So what you're doing matters. It does not go unnoticed. And it's quite frankly critical, critical to people's lives out there right now. So thank you for doing it. And I don't know how long we'll be at this, but it's, it, we're in this for the long haul. Thank you, sir. Jury, my next question will be for you. Um, and like I just said, we mostly track the impact our members are making, but I know it's much more than that. Um, looking back over the last month, what's been the overall impact on this mission, or of, sorry, of this mission from your perspective at the Food Bank Association? Sure. Um, the Ohio National Guard members, without a doubt, have been a true lifeline for all the food banks and their larger network across the state who have been working to respond to increased demand. We're seeing about um, a third of the people that we're serving have never turned to our network for help before. So we're so grateful that we have the support of this extra um, man and woman power on the ground to help us get through it. And not only are they helping us keep our doors open day to day to keep normal operations flowing as much as possible, but they've also helped us to expand a lot of new services that we've never had to offer before to help respond during this crisis. And one of those services is uh, one that the general mentioned related to um, home delivered meals. So that's not something that we did a lot before, but obviously there's a big need for that right now. And we would not have the transportation or staffing resources to be able to do it without the support of the Ohio National Guard. They've really had to step in and help us respond where some of our traditional partners have had to step back, which has been huge for us. And many of our food banks have told us that they simply would not be able to continue operating, keep their doors open, and keep food flowing in and out without the support of the members. Just for context, um, before this crisis, we were distributing about 4 million pounds or so of food a week, and we're doing more than 6 million pounds of food now per week. That's a huge increase with fewer volunteers to support the mission than ever. So it goes without saying that the National Guard is critical to us keeping this lifeline available. Great, thank you. Sir, there's still um, some, seems to be some people who um, may be cautious or confused when they're seeing our uniform people at food banks. Um, why shouldn't they be concerned? Well, I, I would hope that after, after being on mission for over a month now, that some of that concern has been assuaged. Um, our folks who are seen in the community by the community are the community. And, and as I've stated before, these are sisters, brothers, co-workers, neighbors, and the presence of our folks out there in the community doing their job should prove that. There should be absolutely no doubt that what they see is what they're getting, that we're not here to impose any sort of martial law or carrying any weapons. In fact, I would hope that at this point people are pleased when they see the uniforms out there in their neighborhoods because they should know what they're doing. And quite frankly, we should rely on those people who know the guard, see the guard doing what they're doing to help us, to help us tamp down those, those myths those stories about the guard. So, so everyone should be helping us do that, quite frankly. And I hope that the number of people who are concerned about what our guardsmen are doing out there in the communities is reducing every day. Quite frankly, I'd love to see it at zero, but we know that's not going to be the case because there are people who have little, little more to do than sit around the, 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 and, and, and stir these rumors and these myths. But, but, but I believe that the majority of people in our community know what we're doing and why we're there. So I, I'm not too concerned about, about those people who, who want, to, want to cause other people to believe otherwise. Thank you, sir. Well put. Jury, what's one thing that people continue to have questions mm -hmm. about regarding getting help? I know we get a lot of questions about how to get help, how to request help. Um, so what would be that one thing that you continuously see time after time, even a month later, um, that you could clear up for our viewers? 
Sure. Um, as I mentioned earlier, about a third of the people we're serving we've never served before, and we understand that it's hard and humbling to ask for help. Um, and we want to just reassure you that there is no shame in feeding yourself and your family. That is why we're all here. That's why we're all working on this mission together. So, you know, it can be confusing to reach out for help and to figure out where to access that help. Our food banks are very visible in the community. I hope that you're familiar with your local food bank um, who serves a multi-county region in your area. If you're not, the easiest way to find out more is to visit our website at Ohio Food Banks org forward slash coronavirus. At that location, you can see a lot of information not only about the food bank and emergency hunger release services that are available, but also other options for programs that you can apply for that can further help you feed yourself and your families during this time of crisis. I'd encourage those who have lost income who are still struggling to get by to consider applying for SNAP or food stamps, which is a federal program that can help you further afford more food at your local grocery store during this time, as well as some of the other resources that are available on that website. And most of all, don't hesitate to ask a neighbor, ask a friend, talk one another and spread the word. The more that we talk about this and normalize it, the more that we all embrace the fact that we're getting through this together, we're in this together, and that includes our work at the food banks to help you feed yourselves. Thank you, Jury. Sir, question back for you. Um, with Ohio opening back up soon, how long would you estimate that our soldiers and airmen might be supporting food banks as we move forward together as a state? I wish I knew the answer to that question, and it's a, this is a kind of a cascading course of events here that are going to determine that. One will be, of course, how fast we can reopen up the, 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 the economy, reopen up the community, so to speak, uh, because we know that it's not going to happen overnight. We can't just fling the doors open because we will create that peak that we were so concerned about. Uh, we don't have nearly enough people who, uh, we don't have nearly enough ability to test yet. It's coming, but we don't have it just yet. And I don't think we've had nearly enough people who've had the disease to say that if we were to go back full scale that we wouldn't see a secondary peak and probably a more dangerous one than the first. So it will depend on how quickly the economy is reopened, how quickly people get back to work, and quite frankly, how long it takes before the volunteers who work at the food banks are safe based on the assessments by the Ohio Department of Health and their community uh, health commissioners uh, when, it, when they determine it's safe for those people who are at risk to come back out. And I will tell you, it's not going to be like it was before. Uh, when those, you know, we will probably see masks for a good long while into the future. We'll see social distancing when we open things back up again. Those things will continue. The hand washing, the disinfecting, all those things are going to remain very, very, very important. And so how those measures are implemented, how that rheostat is turned up or down, so to speak, will determine how long it takes for this mission to end. So I can't tell you if it's going to be 30 days, 60 days. Um, again, it's, this is a cascading course of events that will determine that. But we want to get folks back to their families, back to work, our soldiers and airmen, as soon as possible. So, so that's what we're going to work on. But we're not going to do it too soon because we can't put these at-risk people at risk by trying to bring them back to the food banks too quickly. Great. Thank you, sir. Dre, how, how would you think that um, food banks and the Ohio National Guard and their role at the food banks has made a difference beyond just the statistical impact that we've talked about? Um, what, what, what do you think about that? I think I have a simple answer for that, and it's that uh, these Ohio National Guard members and members of the Ohio Military Reserve that are serving at our food banks are bringing heart every day to their mission during a time that's really heartbreaking for a lot of people, people who are really struggling sometimes for the first time in their lives. And they serve with kindness and compassion and empathy and with a smile on their face. So they really inspire us to keep going every day. Um, and we're so glad to have them on our team. Thank you. I know um, I spent some time at some of the food banks and uh, I think our members feel the same exact way towards uh, all the people they work alongside at, the, at, at those food banks. Um, how would you say their operations at the different warehouses across the state may have adjusted or changed since COVID hit, how they do business or things that they've had to consider that they've never considered before, even beyond just the home deliveries? Yeah, we've had to change about, just about everything we do in our operations in the course of about five weeks here. So before the Ohio National Guard was deployed about a month ago, we were already quickly changing over how we were doing a 
distributions. Before all of this, we had um, um, nearly 2,000 food pantries across the state who normally serve through um, grocery style settings where people can for the needs of their families that meet their cultural preferences, their dietary needs and restrictions, and, um, to largely shutter those food pantries um, to protect the health and safety of not only our clients, but also our volunteers and staff. So I mean, they're still operating out in their communities to provide food, but they're doing so in alternative ways. Rather than inviting clients inside to their pantry, they're largely pre-packaging food, boxing food. Many of our food banks are doing mass drive-through distributions to try to fill a lot of the gaps that are left in our community. Some of those gaps are ones maybe that some folks aren't familiar with. We know, of course, that K-12 schools remain closed, and while our local schools are doing um, yeoman's work to try to replace those meals, we know large gaps existing throughout the state um, where those meals aren't being replaced. In addition, we have a lot of child care facilities right now that are closed, as well as senior centers and other um, centers where people living with disabilities, for example, normally congregate and, and enjoy meals together. Um, a lot of those populations aren't able to access meals through, through those traditional locations. So um, in large, we're doing a lot to try to replace those gaps. And we're doing so in no contact ways. That's the same for in our warehouse, where we've made sure to implement all of the social distancing guidelines and other sanitization and safety requirements that are being recommended by the team um, you know, at the Ohio Department of Health as well as at the CDC. So just like all of the businesses that are working to get ready to safely invite workers back as we slowly ramp up, that's what our food banks have been doing in partnership with the Ohio National Guard. Thank you so much, Jury. Um, for those viewing, I, we're seeming to have a little bit of a glitch on our, our view, um, our, our stream, so please bear with us. Hopefully those those were kinks work themselves out, but we may have to stop and start again, so just bear with us. <laughs> um, all right, so my next question. Sorry, I have another one for you, Jury. It's going to go right back to you. Sure. Um, speaking of those operations, um, like I mentioned earlier, I've been at some of the food banks actually on Tuesday. I was just at the Dayton Food Bank, um, which was a huge success. They had actually been able to serve 4,500 people in nearly 1,400 households, um, which is just really phenomenal. Um, for those who may not be aware or are even embarrassed to ask the question, um, can you reiterate, I know you mentioned earlier, how they could receive food? Um, are they required to register? I know that's a question that we've gotten quite a bit. Um, and where could they find out about drive-through distributions? Sure. Yeah, normally, um, before this crisis, a lot of our food banks themselves weren't doing a lot of the direct services. So they weren't distributing food to thousands of families like they're doing now. They were instead distributing that food to local partners, local churches, after-school programs, senior centers, those kinds of places where people could access food more regularly in their local community. And as some of that system has had to deteriorate and shutter temporarily and suspend services, you're seeing a lot more food being distributed through our mass drive-through distributions that our food banks are putting on. Um, we're doing that for the interest of no contact, um, no person-to-person -person risk of community spread in providing that food. Um, and we're trying to do it in the most effective way possible. So we're relying heavily on our Ohio National Guard partners as well as partners with local public safety, a lot of our local police departments. Um, I know the Ohio State Highway Patrol has been helping in some of those situations. I know it takes some patience. I know that folks are waiting in long lines. It's not ideal for any of us, but we feel like it's the best way that we can work together to be most efficient to serve the most people. And with that said, it's not the only place that you can access help. There are also many local pantries that are remaining to, are continuing to serve you. Um, but if you're not familiar with them, I know that the food banks are most visible. Um, so you please don't hesitate once again to, to reach out and ask for help. You're not alone. There are many who are doing it for the first time. We understand, again, that it's difficult. We want you to know that it shouldn't be because, like I said, there's no shame in feeding yourself and your family, so we're here to help you with that. I'll just mention our website one more time, ohiofoodbanks.org, where you can find more information about services available near you. Thank you, Jury. Um, something that kind of hit home um, that I heard at the food bank last uh, earlier this week was, uh, it's better to have food on your plate than to be hungry. Um, so I think that really resonates for, for hopefully a lot of people. Um, General Harris, my, my, my last question on the food banks uh, is, is for you. Um, something 
that I've been seeing a lot of our members asked is how our mission at home here um, supporting the food bank may be similar to um, a mission overseas. Um, could you expand on that? Well, before I talk about the mission, I'd like to talk about just the nature of, of serving because service is truly about the relationship between the leader and the led. And leadership doesn't change, whether that's, whether that's in theater, Iraq, Afghanistan, Kosovo, Guantanamo Bay, the, the, the relationship between the leader and that person that, that those people that that leader leads is the most essential element to accomplishing any mission. And that doesn't so, so we know that if we have soldiers, airmen, military reservists who, who understand how to receive a task and a purpose, are empowered with, with the tools they need and the space they need, and the latitude to be creative, to get that done, they're going to get it done. And it doesn't matter what that mission is, whether that's putting artillery rounds downrange or flying F-16s uh, in support of troops on the ground, regardless of what that mission is. If we have leaders who understand how to visualize the mission, communicate that mission, give their subordinates task and purpose, and the latitude to get the mission done, they're going to get the mission done. And that's, that doesn't change, again, food banks, or deployment to theater, it doesn't matter. I think that our folks have, have demonstrated that. Um, our our, our uh, success, the productivity of the folks in the food banks has been by some of our most junior people. Some of our sites are led by some of our most junior people, again, who understand the task, they understand the purpose of what they're doing, and they're enthusiastic about doing that. That gives them that intrinsic, that intrinsic successful feeling of being a part of something that's, that's greater than themselves. Um, that's that's the most important thing trust between the leader and the led and the ability to let folks and empower empower soldiers and airmen to get the mission done and and the second thing is the great thing about the national guard is that not only do they bring their military skill set to the table but they also bring their civilian skills to the table so while a person may be a a, a mechanic a wheeled vehicle mechanic in, in the national guard they could very well work in the food service industry and their civilian jobs. So they bring that entire skill set, a double skill set, so to speak, to the, to, to, the, to the response. And that gives us so much agility and ability to adapt and create and solve problems, which is exactly what we see happening out there. So, again, I couldn't be more proud uh, of our people, not just in the food banks, but on all the missions that we're doing right now, because they've, they've adapted and they've overcome and they've persevered. And again, we don't know how long this mission's gonna be. And nobody has whined one bit about that because everybody's all in to make sure the state of Ohio comes out the best that we can at the end of this thing. Great, thank you, sir. So that actually concludes most of our questions on the food bank's uh, support mission. So we're gonna transition into the, the, the medical support being provided at uh, various correctional institutions around the state. Um, and my first question, is to Captain Gonzalez. Um, what type of medical support is being provided at Elkton Federal Correctional Institute, and is there any indication of how much longer they may be there? The correctional facility mission set was to help augment the civilian medical uh, treatment facilities there located on site. Um, they were seeing an initial surge of patients as well as faculty and staff that were having um, symptomology and, and um, some shortfalls within their staffing levels. Elkton specifically has a little bit more uh, capability there on their premises. Um, specifically, we brought a mobile clinic that had the capability to do some critical care um, as well as some moderate care and patient hold, which would be uh, translated to basically a step down. So if a patient had to go to a local hospital they could potentially be released a little bit earlier and then be able to come back to the facility and we would be able to provide oversight. So we've got military medical professionals there at that facility, um, physicians, nurse practitioners, physician assistants, nurses, as well as our medics. Thank currently you. located at Elton. Thank you. What about Pickaway? Pickaway's mission, um, they specifically asked for medics and so we have approximately 20 medics there. I mean, their primary mission is to conduct assessments. Assessments would be um, basically looking at symptomatic and asymptomatic individuals that were potentially exposed within a given population to see if they are starting to have symptoms such as a fever, um, respiratory issues, flu-like stuff. Thank you. Um, and then any other support being provided that you uh, could speak to? 
um, besides the assessments in the mobile clinic, um, it's just the overall healthcare picture. Great, thank you. Um, General Harris, my next question is for you. Um, why would you say there is such a need for support at those prisons and why and the Ohio National Guard supporting that? Well, well, first and foremost, the prisons are congregate living facilities. Uh, you have large cohorts of people who are living in, in, in close proximity to each other. And uh, that in, a, in and of itself creates challenges for a pandemic like this. It is just, it is inherent to the nature of, of, the, of the facilities. So uh, what's important is, is ensuring that we provide the best protection. And I will tell you, Director Annette Chambers-Smith is doing a fantastic job bringing the right people around the table with her to solve this problem. Uh, but it's making sure that we provide the best protection we can, not only for the inmates, but for the staff that works there and for their families, because those staff members are going back and forth home, some of them, every day. We want to make sure we're protecting all those folks and providing the best care that we can if, in fact, they, they become sick. Thank you, sir. Captain Gonzalez, I'm going to go back to you. Um, what type of specific medical support is being provided at um, correctional facilities? Um, is it testing? Is it acute care? Is it just temperature taking? Um, could you expand a little bit on that? Um, and is there anything like transportation being provided? Absolutely. A little bit of everything taking place. Uh, we have the capability to actually care for patients, so a treatment perspective. We have an ability to conduct triage to determine um, if an individual would need a higher level of care. Uh, we're currently not doing transport, although equipped to be able to do that if the need shall arise or should arise. Um, and then also um, the biggest thing is assessing the current population that are asymptomatic that have had a potential exposure to somebody that is symptomatic. And so just making sure that everybody is, is doing well. Great, thank you. Um, and I have a, a, a back to back question for you. Mm -hmm. um, and it's actually two parts. Um, I know that some terminology can be really confusing as it relates to COVID-19 um, and, and symptoms and all the different medical terms that follow suit. Um, could you explain the difference between quarantine and isolation for our viewers? Absolutely. Quarantine would be is if you've had a known exposure, but you're currently not presenting any type of symptoms, which would be the high fever, the respiratory illness, the flu-like feelings. Isolation would be you're actually actively presenting symptomology, um, high fever, not feeling well, flu-like symptoms, and you would isolate yourself from others. And then depending upon the severity of those symptoms, it would potentially require an escalation in care, but more often than not, if you self-isolate um, and you're overall, in, you know, you're overall in pretty good and healthy condition, you should be able to, in about 14 days, start feeling pretty better. Thank you. I think that's an important distinction between the two. Definitely. Um, so, so with that, um, what type of safety and health measures are our medical soldiers and airmen taking to keep them safe while they're on mission? Our healthcare providers, military healthcare providers, are well versed in the appropriate wear of their personal protective equipment, and they're fully equipped with those um, when treating patients. Uh, it would include your N95s and being uh, fit tested. It would be any type of goggles or eye protection, Tyvek suits, gowns, gloves, um, the whole bit in order to ensure that they don't leave themselves at risk to potentially contract contract the illness. Great, thank you. I know our safety is our number one priority when we're on mission. Absolutely. Um, General Harris, my next question is for you. Sure. Um, how is the physical safety of our members being addressed while they're supporting um, ODRC and the mission at the prisons? Well, it's important to point out that for this mission, our soldiers and airmen that are working in these facilities or will be working in these facilities um, are, are secondary. They're in support to the Ohio Department of Rehab and Corrections, ODRC. So we follow their guidelines and we rely on them for the physical security of our folks inside these facilities. Now, each person go or each person goes through pretty significant training before they before they go there. Um, we're not going to put folks inside one of these facilities not understanding what they're getting into. But our medical providers, um, they receive training from the Department of Rehab and Corrections on everything from donning and doffing the right PPE, which they already know how to do. But we want to make sure that they've got the right training. But we're not in the business of running prisons. We're not in the business of even running the medical sections or medical divisions for prisons. Our job is to provide support for the people who are there. And that's what we go there to do. So we rely very heavily on them for not only the, 
the guidelines on how to interact with the inmates, but also the physical security of our people when they're inside the, those facilities. Thank you very much, sir. Captain Gonzalez, um, a question back for you. Um, the spread of the virus is, is a big concern within correctional institutions because of that congregated living. Um, how is the Ohio National Guard helping to mitigate that spread um, by supporting their medical staff? Uh, the biggest part is identifying individuals that have symptomology early and being able to care for those individuals and place them in a potentially a different location within that facility. I would say the second big thing is individuals that don't require a higher echelon of care um, keeping them there and treating them to limit the exposure of others. So those are your two big rocks, is identifying who's been exposed, who potentially has symptoms, and trying to care for them on site as opposed to moving them to different locations and exposing a lot of individuals. Thank you. Matt, Jim, could I add to that for just course, a moment? Of course, sir. Of course. There, there, there are so many things that are happening inside these facilities, and I think it's important to understand that, that when you see the elevation numbers, particularly coming out of the prisons, it shouldn't be as concerning as it may be to you, simply because the testing, the, the, the percentage of the inmates that are being tested inside the uh, Ohio's prisons are pretty significant. It's very important to understand that, that so many people who have this, this illness are asymptomatic. They don't have any indication that they have the illness. So particularly inside the congregate living facilities, testing, particularly of the staff as they go in and out is very important and there's a lot of that happening and of course when you test more you're going to see higher numbers but it's also important to point out that there's so many other mitigating measures that are happening inside the walls of those prisons for example us establishing the tents and the out out the uh, exterior facilities tents uh, shower facilities bathroom facilities so that they can spread the inmates out uh, but they're also doing things like looking at the HVAC systems inside the system. How should they modify the HVAC systems? How should they be um, just sleeping, sleeping the inmates head to toe to create that spacing between the respiratory systems? Just really, really innovative things like that. They have environmental engineers who are who are looking at what's happening inside. They're looking at. They've got epidemiologists that are being that are being tasked to support nothing but the correctional facility. So there's a lot of good work and innovative work being done inside our, our, our prisons to make sure that we are, we are checking the spread of this coronavirus and making sure that the folks who, who are tested positive or showing symptomology get the best possible medical care that they can get. Great, thank you, sir. And I do have a question right back for you. Um, I know we talked about how many soldiers we have supporting the food bank mission earlier, but um, approximately how many current members are supporting the prisons and the medical support mission going on there? Well, the medical support mission, we probably have 50 soldiers, airmen, supporting that mission, but we also have other soldiers that are doing things supporting the prisons. Uh, for example, as I mentioned, setting up setting up that deployability, that, deploy, that disaster response bed down system. Um, it's very important, again, creating, creating non-traditional space so that, so that we can spread the inmates out. And, and also doing engineer assessments inside the facilities, um, helping them use non-traditional space, like gymnasiums and, and uh, schools, for example, to spread those prisons out. Non-traditional housing space is being used for housing and what sorts of things have to go into doing that. So our, our engineers are, are very involved with that in addition to the medical folks who are on mission inside the facilities. Great, thank you, sir. Captain Gonzalez, I have a question um, back to you. Um, what happens if a member that's providing patient care uh, at the prison may start feeling sick? Absolutely. Um, so the health and the welfare of our service members is our number one priority. And so if they begin having any type of symptoms, depending upon what type of symptoms that they're having, we would ensure that they received prompt medical care um, in order to be evaluated and then at that point determine what potentially they could have been exposed to and then determine the next steps from there based upon Ohio Department of Health and CDC guidance. Okay, great, thank you. Um, and as we wrap up our, our, our Facebook Live here today, um, sir, my next three questions are going to be back to back for you. <laughs> um, what would you say is the most important aspect of our support to prisons in Ohio? Well, the most important aspect is, is, is meeting the need. It, again, it's, we're in support of the Department of Rehab and Corrections. And one of the greatest things about the Ohio Guard is that we're, we're a very large guard and we have a lot of capabilities. So, so we have some we have a lot of medical capability, both both unit-based 
plus folks who have those skills that may not that may not be their primary job in the guard for example i know some folks who are administrators but their civilian job is nursing and they can bring those skills to the table for us that's, that's a wonderful capability so so being flexible and to meet the needs of the Department of Rehab and Corrections. As I mentioned, if they're looking for engineer assessments for how they might be able to build additional shower space or bathroom spaces to use non-traditional facilities for housing, how can we help do that? We, how do we, if they need help with additional testing, can we get folks trained to, to help them with that testing? As we look to the future, as they test more of the staff, we can full well expect, because we know that so many people, so many of the staff are gonna be asymptomatic. We may find positives that have no symptoms whatsoever. How do we backfill that staff in, in, in the facilities? Those are all potential missions that we're looking at. So I think the most important key is just flexibility and bringing the right skills to bear for whatever it is that the director there needs. And we have that, we have that. 16,000 people assigned to the guard, we can meet just about every need that they're going to have. Great. Thank you, sir. Um, so pretty much helping where help is needed. Helping where help is needed. That's 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 what I meant to say. <laughs> you said it perfectly, sir. Um, one thing that you've mentioned a couple of times and as we've been talking about the, the medical support mission at the correctional institutions is um, that we're trained for trained and ready for a multitude of diverse uh, missions as as the requests flow in um, and there's been a lot of support provided so far and one of those unique capabilities that you discussed was the derbis what we call the disaster relief bed down system um, and that was recently constructed at pickaway um, what is that for our viewers that may not know what that disaster relief bed down system is and how will it support the prison well it, it, it's one of the one of the best kept secrets uh, in the National Guard I've discovered. And the, the DRBS is, as you mentioned, a disaster response bed down system. And, uh, and imagine a tent city. So we bring in these Alaska style tents. They're, uh, they're a rubberized canvas style tent with, with, with rubberized canvas floors. And we establish these, but they come with all the life support stuff that's also needed around that. So for example, if we were to go into a very austere environment, like we just did, uh, we delivered these to Puerto Rico in the response to the earthquake, they, they come with not just the shelters, but they come with shower facilities, they come with bathroom facilities, they come with power generation systems to, to power these small cities, they come with uh, heaters or environmental control units so that we can manage the, the heat, we can control the heat, the temperatures inside these facilities, and, and all the stuff that goes with it, the generators and, and, and a few people to operate them. So if you can imagine uh, just a complete austere environment and within a couple days an entire tent city that's self-sustaining showing up that's what the DRBS is why is that important in this type of mission because we can we can establish that very quickly and create very very fast living spaces for the Department of Corrections that that is for the most part self-sustaining now we were able to tie some of their systems there down in Pickaway County but we can bring this entire self-contained city so to speak to bear very quickly and in fact we brought it back from Puerto Rico specifically so we could have it on standby for this type of mission so it's incredibly versatile incredibly flexible and it's an amazing capability for this kind of disaster great thank you sir um, we did get one question from our live feed that I thought maybe Captain Gonzalez could answer regarding um, our soldiers that are in support of the medical mission are they required to wear their PPE at all times while they're within the facility Correct. Um, within the facilities, they're operating under the notion that anybody and everybody um, is a suspected COVID positive. Therefore, they're taking all the necessary precautions to ensure that they um, are protected. Thank you so much for answering that one. Definitely. Um, and sir, our last question, uh, earlier you had mentioned when we talked, our last town hall was um, on building the medical capacity. Um, just to give a up and, and, and look back at that mission and, and how we're still supporting that. Um, for those alternate medical care sites that were identified, are our joint engineering assessment teams still supporting those? Um, are they on hold? If so, um, could you explain why that might actually be a good thing? Well, they're not, they're not completely on hold. The answer is yes, we do have engineer assessment teams that are still working around those sites and some will ask why if we've already, if we're already flat, flatten the curve and we haven't exceeded our medical capacity. Um, but we still have to ensure that we're ready for a second peak um, or even a third that we know is not uncommon with pandemics. But the mission has evolved pretty significantly. Uh, the nice thing about flattening the curve is that it creates space and time. 
and that created that gave our hospital systems the, the maneuver space to be able to make different kinds of decisions. So in other states where you saw huge build outs, convention centers, for example, like the Javits Center in New York, uh, our hospitals were able to look internally and build out additional spaces, again, non-traditional spaces, what we call soft spaces. So by doubling up rooms and uh, beds in hotel rooms, or in, in the case of uh, Cleveland Clinic, they took uh, an education center, a health education center, a, a school basically, a health education school, and turned that into a care facility. So they were able to take those internal soft spaces and create a lot of surge capacity without having to build uh, new stuff. And that's happening all over the state. So, so while we're still in the business of making sure that we have surge capacity, it looks very different than we thought it was going to look. And the other thing is, yes, we are still building out some of those alternate care facilities, again, in preparation for a secondary or a third, a third surge, uh, but, but they're smaller. We've scaled them back. Uh, we're putting them in what's called a warm status so that we have the language for the leases in place. We have language for contracts in place and all those things. We're just not executing those. So we have these insurance policies, as I call them, uh, to be prepared for surges, but we're not, we're, we're, we're being good stewards of resources and we're not executing anything that we don't absolutely have to execute to be ready for that. I, I liken it to, to our medevac pilots, you know, they go through the entire startup checklist and then they shut the battery off so that if they have to use it, they turn the battery on, they hit the starter and they're ready to fly. That's kind of what we're trying to create here with these alternate care sites. We, we, we don't know if we're going to need the capacity because no one has a crystal ball. Uh, we're following the best modeling that we have, and we're being good stewards of the resources while still making sure that we're ready in case there's a surge. Thank you, sir. That was our last question for our town hall. We haven't actually got too many questions on our live feed. Um, so just in closing, I wanted to um, see if Jory had any closing comments or um, General Harris, if you had anything you wanted to end with, um, I'll have you go first. Okay, I'd, I'd like to say, uh, we'll let Jory close it out as our guest here. Uh, I would like to say I'm just so proud of not only our Ohio National Guard, but Ohioans. We know that we flatten the curve. And I know there's a lot of impatience developing out there, not just for, for some of our guardsmen who, who want to get back to their civilian jobs, but also by everybody in the community who's tired of being at home under these stay-at-home orders. But as I mentioned earlier, the transition out of this is going to be a very gradual, very, very deliberate process um, to ensure that we can keep everyone safe and, again, not exceed our our medical capacity, but it's also important to, to just to say that I don't think that life is going to be anything like any like it was for anyone who's experienced this pandemic. This is going to be a life changing experience. It's going to think about it's going to change the way we think about just social spaces. It's going to change the way we think about large gatherings. It's going to change the way we think about just the things that we touch and how we how how we go through a door. Uh, we're going to be different on the other side of that. In some ways, that's better. In some ways, that better. But I will tell you this: I couldn't be more proud of Ohioans for 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 the, for what we've done. We truly are setting the standard for the rest of the nation. And while it may not feel that way right now, we're winning, and we're winning big. Thank you, sir. Jury. I couldn't agree more that Ohio is really setting the standard in a lot of ways. And from our perspective at the food banks, um, it, it couldn't be more true for us as well. Governor DeWine's support has been enormously critical, including the deployment of the Ohio National Guard members to support our collective mission, as well as additional funding and help from his team to figure out how we can make sure that Ohioans are fed. We have great members of our congressional delegation who have been doing a lot of important work as well in their roles. So all of the leaders across the state and representing us um, you know, in D.C. are going to battle every day just like our food bank workers and the Ohio National Guard members serving at our location. So I just want to say thank you again so much to everyone at the top all the way down to the folks who are working so hard long hours every day to make sure those food boxes are packed and ready to go when you're coming out to us. So thank you. Awesome. Thank you so much. And um, just want to thank Captain Gonzalez for being on our panel as well. Um, with that, we're going to conclude our town hall this morning. And thank you to all of our viewers who bared with us um, through some of the technical glitches of our town hall today. Um, we will work on those for next time. Um, have a wonderful rest of your day. Thank you.